Um, I will call out the roll, and if you would respond with here or present, whatever you prefer. Uh, Sarah Bledsoe? Here. Richard Campbell? Here. Lori G? Here. Ed Maioshi? Here. And I'm John Eichmann. Uh, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. The upcoming meeting dates are March 9th, 2021 and April 20th, 2021. We have uh, two sets of minutes to take a look at, uh, starting with November 17th, 2020 meeting. Has everybody had a chance to review those minutes? If so, I'll accept a motion to approve. I'm gonna abstain from this because I actually don't have those. <laughs> Very good, you sir. Were, you weren't here. Good move. I'll, I'll make the motion. Thank you, Lori. Do we have a second. second? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And Sarah abstains. Uh, the other meeting minutes are from December 8th, 2020. And have you had a chance to review those? Mm -hmm. And a motion? I'll make the motion. Thank you, Lori. Uh, Richard, do you want to second that? Second. Thank you. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And Sarah abstains. I'm going to abstain. <laughs> no problem. Okay, the first item on the agenda is Marl Crane. For, Mar for Marl Crane tonight, um, we are going to schedule or excuse me, declare a lead agency and schedule a public hearing for the April meeting. Uh, starting with declaring lead agency, could I have a motion for that? So moved. So moved. Uh, okay. Second Ed's motion. Thank you very much. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And a motion to schedule a public hearing for our April 20th meeting. So moved. Thank you. Second. Thank you, Ed. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Do we have anyone representing the applicant here to speak for the project? Yes. Yes. Hi, Terry Hahn, uh, Principal LADA PC uh, Land Planners. We're the site planners for the project. Was there something that you wanted me to speak about specifically or? Terry. I, I, Terry, I think if you could talk just about what the changes were you've made to the plans, and I think um, the lighting would be, I know that you added lighting, and then I think we need to just do a little bit of a discussion about the brush drop-off area and the um, the potential for um, the bog turtle, like if there's any um, conflict with the bog turtle restoration that has to happen. Okay. Um, but first, if you could just give a quick summary of the project, so for people that have, weren't at the last meeting, so they can understand what the project is. Yeah. Do you um, have a plan or do you want me to show a plan? I, I actually, I have a PowerPoint if I can share screen. Perfect. Okay. Uh, so the, uh, again, my name is Terry Hahn, LADA PC, um, a land planners for the applicant, which is Morrow Equipment Company. Uh, the project is located at 216 Lime Kiln Road. Um, uh, on the uh, call, although not um, intending to speak, are representatives from the from Morrow Equipment. Um, we also have representatives from the project attorney, Keenan Bean, and the project architect, in case questions come up. Um, the, just the, the nature of the project, um, basically the um, company, Morrow Equipment Company, uh, does um, rentals for the uh, industrial cranes for construction um, industry. Uh, their existing facility is in Millwood and it's too small um, and they'd like to move to this location. Um, the um, 
it's centrally located within their service area for New York State, so it works very nicely. Uh, they have a basic Monday to Friday schedule, um, although they have uh, 25 employees, only 20 will be on site. Um, there is no lighting proposed in the storage area, and there are very minimal trucks. Um, the way this works is the crane parts come via the a truck. Um, it then um, gets uh, reviewed, processed, uh, just made sure there's any maintenance that needs to happen and then goes to the storage yard. Those parts then get put back on a truck and they go and get assembled at the construction site. Uh, so there's no, um, there's no assembly uh, on site itself. Um, the project is uh, 25.96 acres located on Lime Kiln Road, it's zoned I-1. Um, this is location plan. Um, just a couple things that came up from the last meeting. There was a question about whether or not our wetlands on site are um, uh, what, who has jurisdiction. DEC decided that they had jurisdiction over the property due to bog turtles um, across the street. However, they decided not to take the wetlands for a wetland permit. So the jurisdiction for the wetlands remains with the town and Army Corps. We do not propose any wetland disturbance, um, but there is 1.25 acres of um, uh, 100 foot buffer area, mostly due to restoration uh, that is going to be required for um, our conversations with DEC regarding bog turtles um, and um, just a transformation from a cornfield uh, to meadow. Um, just uh, conversation like what we were talking about, what happens here at the site itself right now, the existing contractor's recycling yard or the town's brush collection area is located at the front of this property um, at the entrance. We're proposing to use the same entrance location and drive, um, but then there's the existing cornfield towards the back of the site um, or the north side of the site, which is adjacent to the commuter lot, which is opposite the DOT garage. Um, the bog turtle area itself is located on the west side of Lon Lime Kiln Road. Um, and then we have a bunch of uh, uh, two wetland areas, wetland A and wetland B. And then DEC, because of the bog turtle proximity, has determined that there is a 300 foot, what they call zone two um, area on the site. Uh, let's see, hang on. Okay, uh, we're proposing 26,000 square feet. Uh, as a contractor's yard, um, as it's defined, it's a permitted use. Um, we're going to use the existing uh, entry. We're required to have 43 parking spaces, but we're proposing, given the limited number of um, employees, uh, just to have 24 parking spaces with 19 spaces deferred, be on-site sanitary disposal, individual wells, and our stormwater system would meet all the uh, DEC requirements. We do require two variances, one for a portion of the building to go to 42 feet, and also um, in response to a recent uh, change in the regulations that talks about material storage piles, our material storage piles because it's um, uh, crane parts stacked on top of one another will go to 30 feet high. Um, just a general sense of where we're at. Um, the building is located uh, more than 780 feet away from Lime Kiln Road. Uh, it's almost, it's in excess of 1200 feet uh, the driveway to get to the building. So we're located towards the back of the building or the back of the site or the north side of the site. Um, and then the closest uh, dimension, uh, which is the um, I-84 uh, access ramp is 280 feet to the building. One of the things that we talked about uh, before, um, and there is a change here, uh, there is a crane, a yard crane um, that picks up the material, the individual tower pieces, which are about 30 feet long uh, or so, um, and picks them up off of the trucks, puts them in the storage yard, storage yard to the buildings. And that's located behind the building. The crane itself, uh, in our last meeting, we talked about 145 feet um, in response to some of the questions that came up. The Moro has looked, re-looked at that. And instead of using a dedicated um, specific um, type of crane that they have, they're actually gonna take one of their work cranes, take it out of service and install it here, um, which reduces the overall height to 137 feet but more importantly, it, it reduces the overall jib height. That's the, the piece, the horizontal piece um, below um, 100 feet. So it's only 90 feet high. 
so that that's what was able to uh, reduce the height. But they, this is this is as low as they can go. Um, and so they really took the time to look at the crane heights, the crane pieces to, to come up with the, the lowest crane that they could possibly come up with. Um, uh, this what we talked before the ZBA determined that the crane was equipment. Um, we have been, uh, we submitted a, an application to the ARB and there's been a number of changes that have occurred. Um, the variance area is the, the, in the blue square where the building goes up to 42 feet high. Um, and that's, that's just a portion of the building. Um, but the uh, ARB requested a number of different uh, changes to the office area that we have added to our plans uh, so that you can see uh, a, on the office section, that's the bump out uh, on the building here uh, in the, in the right hand image um, where they've added a stone uh, veneer uh, at the water line, basically from the ground up to the, the bottom of the windows. And then there's smooth panels that go up uh, to the um, parapet area here uh, and just generally sort of up doing an upgrade for that um, uh, entry um, office component. Uh, and that's, that's pretty much what the ARB was looking for. So we have modified those uh, elements and we'll be resubmitting back to the ARB for their final review. And just for clarification, the ARB, um, in the minutes that they sent to me or the notes that they sent me, they told me that they had actually approved the plans and um, subject to the facade changes. So they, they're, you're gonna submit back to them, but you do not need to go in front of them again. Oh, okay. Oh, that, thank, I appreciate that clarification because I, I wasn't sure we went back and forth and I wasn't sure which way they were going to go, but um, our intent is to, to uh, have a final set of plans and we can forward those to them just for their records. Perfect. Um, one of the things that the, the commission, the planning board had asked us, you know, what does the building look like with the crane? So we've added um, that view uh, so that you can see uh, what the crane would look like behind the building. Uh, this is coming down the project drive as you're coming towards the building right at the parking area so that you can see the crane behind it. Um, and then we have a similar view. This is, this is on the um, e looking east uh, in the, the western portion of the parking area. So you can kind of have a profile or a section across the site uh, looking at the building and then the, the crane on the north side of the building. Um, other vertical elements in the vicinity did go and actually took um, uh, newer photographs right across the street. As you can see on the location plan is the very, very large um, uh, the, the cell tower uh, that is on the DOT property. Uh, also further to the west is the rather extensive utility um, pole corridor that comes down the hill um, uh, from uh, the top of, you know, above uh, North Lime Kiln Road and then down towards 84. Um, in that view, you also, from that view, you also see um, how the DOT crane um, uh, is above the trees. It's kind of underneath the view spots for the people uh, within um, uh, the uh, zoom here, but uh, if you if you move the, um, the what you can see for the individual people, you know, like the people talking, you can see there's an arrow showing the DOT crane over on the far right hand side of the, um, uh, the screen. A um, couple other things. Um, the uh, can, I, can I ask a quick question on that? Just for comparative, did, did you, you know how tall that cell tower is and how tall those power lines? I don't, I don't know with um, actual certainty. I've been trying to figure out if there's a way to find out. But um, the, the cell tower here looks um, quite a bit higher than 150 feet. Um, when you look at how far it towers over the trees, just from a relative perspective, um, it, it's pretty high. Uh, but I will try and find something more definitive. I mean, I guessed the last time I was here, but I don't really like to guess on some of these things. So. Uh, I, I'll see if I can come up with a more definitive answer. Okay. So some of the questions from last meeting that were raised, um, the, uh, we were asked to uh, reconfigure the lights 
along the entry drive to add a pole at the driveway. And so we have done that, as you can see here in the yellow circle. Um, we submitted a drainage report and preliminary erosion control plans. And my apologies, Pete, I know I only sent them to you yesterday. So I know that you've not had a chance to look at those at all. That's okay. Um, uh, also, Terry, if I can just add, and uh, for uh, the planning board, I did have a call yesterday with uh, Chris and Paji at uh, Larry Paji's office. And so uh, one of our comments was that, uh, that uh, you'll need to provide a full stormwater pollution prevention plan, but um, Christian um, ex explained that they were hoping to provide the full stormwater pollution prevention plan once a seeker determination uh, is made, and that uh, at this point that they just um, submitted hydraulic calculations uh, to compare pre and post development um, runoff to make sure that there's not going to be any um, increase in stormwater runoff off of the site after the project is built. So um, I don't have a problem, you know, with that. Um, uh, you know, that's really the most important thing for seeker purposes is the hydraulic um, calculations. All the rest of the stuff is just st pretty much standard stuff that's in a book. Um, so um, uh, we'll take a look at the hydraulic uh, calcs and, and um, uh, you know, we'll go from there, but uh, I mean, having worked with Paji's office in the past, they usually do a pretty good job. So, um, so we'll get something out on that, you know, separately, but I don't have an issue with holding off on the full, full SWIP until after we make a secret determination. Also, I, I would just notice that, uh, or note on the erosion control plans that we were, although it's one of the phases is a little convoluted, we were able to uh, create phases that are five acres or less for the for the erosion control. So that, okay. I think that that's a, in terms of seeker perspective, that that's one of those big things that you'd be looking yep. for. Okay. All right. Okay. Good. Thank you. Sure. We have, and do then we have uh, that phasing plan. Yes. Okay. Just got it. I think when was it, Terry? Yesterday. Yeah, it was. It was digitally delivered yesterday. So the yeah. the paper copies are coming as well. So yeah. those are those are on the way. So we have okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't think I got to that. It, um, I, I did see it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and then uh, the other comments were more um, uh, minor issues associated with the plans. Um, uh, EAF got modified. Um, we did go to initial the ARB and then the our, uh, zone, our ZBA application is in process. They can't um, mm -hmm. make a decision until seeker is over. Uh, so um, we are... Um, going, you know, making sure that we have all our I's dotted and T's crossed before we trigger that application. Um, and then this was just the approvals. So that that was kind of, that's my summary. Um, I don't, the, I think um, one of the other questions that you were asking was about the uh, brush collection area. It, is there a specific question that um, I, I should answer? Uh, my question, Terry, is, is um, I, I guess at some point we'll have to probably put some sort of fencing along that area or the boundary of that area, probably. And I, I don't know if that's going to be a requirement related to the turtles or not, but um, certainly to demarcate the edge of the, the brush area vis-a-vis -vis your site. So um, that'll have to be shown on the plan. And I also noted that you have a you have the sign there um, and is I guess, do you have any idea what the sign is going to look like yet at this point? Yeah, the sign is shown on the um, site plans on the detail sheets. Okay. Um, I don't have direct access to that right at this particular moment, um, but it, it has been, it was part of the original submission back, Okay. Perfect. Um, you know, before December and, and continues to be on the detail sheet. So it, it shows what's there. Okay. Um, just so the planning board understands the sign is located Right, oh. you know, right where the new pole. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right here. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Um, so, with respect to the uh, brush area, the DEC um, wanted to be sure that we showed, uh, or that that you can't go beyond this area. So ultimately, there will be a fence. It's not a 
it's not a screen fence or something like that, but it, it's probably just going to be maybe a two rail fence or, or something just so that use of this area can't expand, okay, that, that you can't go closer to the wetlands, because what they want to do is the use area right now for the brush is way, way it's everything. And they don't, they don't like this with its proximity to the trees. The wetland, just so we all understand, the wetland limit is way back here. But because it's within the 300 foot bog turtle zone, the DEC is, is saying that they, they, they want to see that reclaimed, go back to uh, meadow and um, uh, let it just be a potential turtle habitat. So that, that's kind of where they're at. Thank you. Michelle, um, do we have to have any kind of an easement on that for the town or have you guys discussed that internally? Um, I'm going to defer that to the attorney, but I, um, oh, that's right. I forgot that Michael's on the call. Right? But before I speak to that, I just have one more question for you, Terry. Sure. Um, are we going to have, can we have shielding on the lights so that they're shielded? I don't know which direction they're going to be facing, but um, they're shielded towards the turtle habitat and wetland area. Um, the if you'll notice the the light fixtures that we're proposing are dar dark sky compliant with very limited throw. Um, they're all LEDs. Um, this this outer line here is 0 0.25 foot candles. So the the 10.1 foot candle. By the time you get out here, there's there's nothing. Uh, okay. You know that it, it's a zero. So so the um, I I think. Um, the days in the past where we put house side shields and we did a number of things for the shielding with the LED lights, I have much better control uh, to the throw and, and the shields don't really make a lot of sense anymore. Okay, great. Okay. We ever, um, did you ever confirm with the ARB or did you make a decision about the color of the crane? Uh, the, we, it's funny you should mention this, Sorry. Um, <laughs> from our, our previous applications in other towns, we've done a lot of experimenting with color uh, and, and um, uh, uh, doing um, 3D modeling against the sky. And we have come to the conclusion that the light gray color, which is consistent with the colors of cell towers and the utility towers, are the, is the one that fades the, the most often. Um, all other colors, white, black, green, uh, at some point, it, either in the over the year or in a specific weather, shows up much more dominantly in the sky than that color. So are we we're settled then? Gray is is your color? That that's our proposal is is for it to be light color, or a light gray color. Okay. And that pretty much matches the top, the color of the top of your building, if, um, if it, I noticed correctly. It, it's the, it, it matches the lighter gray color of the building. We have a dark gray color and a lighter gray color. Right. I thought it, it kind of hit it nicely as a result. Are there any other putting, questions? Go ahead. I'm sorry, John. Yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna say, are you putting any signage or anything up on the top of the crane? Um, it, <laughs> Uh, my, my client would tell you they'd love to put um, uh, their name on the crane, but I did make them take it off for the, the uh, images. Um, the only thing I don't know at the moment, and this is subject to, to not this board, but um, uh, FAA requirements is I don't know about the, the little red light on the top or not. That was going to be my next question. Okay. Yeah, yeah it, it's, it's really, we don't have any control over it. If they want it, then we have to put it on there. Michelle, is there anything with putting a sign on the crane? Would it come back to us or come back to somewhere else? If so uh, I'm just to... trying to think of the sign code. I mean, we don't typically allow, yeah. like, for instance, if there's trucks parked in a, you know, we don't let people park trucks with advertisements on the side. And that, so I have to read through the code and see if anything would strictly prohibit that or um, allow it. But my guess is um, it might be prohibited. I'll, I'll look through and see what I can find out. It, it looked like, I think, I saw the slide flash up that the decision of the zoning board was that this is considered equipment on the site versus a building or or anything affixed. So I'm guessing it's the same as a truck would be, right? That's probably that's what I would assume. But I'll I'll definitely um, take a read through that 
Terry and see what I can find out for you. Yeah, I mean, I'm assuming the same thing at this point. Yes, it was deemed equipment. It's it was it's not a permanent fixture. I have a question. This is Scott. Yes, Scott. So the crane is approximately what is it? 160, 170 foot high. No, it's um, we're proposing it at 137 feet. It changes it. Scott. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, you're not using the crane to build a eight story building. So is there a particular reason why it has to be so high? Yes. Are you plan on stacking materials that high in the air? No, when you um, because of the length of the crane, the, the length of the crane sections that this is going to pick up, it has to be able to pick it up, come over the, the material section, the material sections. It also has to be able to take that um, the, the crane section and go over the top of the building. Okay, so crane sections are brought to the site laying horizontally on a flatbed trailer. Correct. And then maybe they're about a five or six foot, you know, cross section. And your building is what, 35 foot high? The, the middle section is 42 feet. All right, so 42 foot high. So seems to be a lot of uh, leeway there. You would think so, but um, they, they've ran the numbers to make sure that because the, the way the jib works, it's 90 feet. Underneath the jib is where the hook is. So that hangs down a certain distance, um, but they, they made it the, the shortest that they possibly could. There's enough clearance, but there's not an extra 20 some odd feet high. Um, I also noticed that uh, Peter Jurin from um, uh, Moro uh, is shown now. Peter, do, would you like to respond to that? Mute. Uh, yeah, hang on. I'm trying to. I'm trying. I'm trying to unmute. Sorry about that. Yeah, one of the. Not only we have the height of the jib, but below that the hook hangs, and that has to be about ten to fifteen feet below the underside of the jib, and then attached to that are the slings that are used to raise and lower the components, and those are usually about twenty feet long. So from the bottom of the jib to where the load is we typically lose about 40 to 45 feet of actual hook height. So that's one of the reasons why the crane has to be at that elevation. All right, is that something you must have it laid out on paper? Is that something you can forward to us just so we can take a look at that? Sure, we can put a drawing together showing what an actual lifted component would look like. Yeah, because from what, what I'm hearing, you, you, you must just about have that. Isn't that what went into factoring in your required uh, tower crane height? Correct. Yes. All right, so if you could just forward that to us, please. Sure, yeah, we'll do a drawing up real fast and have that out to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Yep, thanks, Doug. Other questions by board members or professionals? If not, we thank you, Terry and Peter, okay. for your time and presentation, and we'll see you in April. Thank Great. you very Thank much. you again for your time, we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on to sketch plans. Um, Hopewell Senior Living for the rest of the board members has withdrawn um, their place on the agenda for this evening. They'll be back to see us, I believe in March. In fact, I'm sure in March. Um, so we'll take that up then. So we move on to sketch plans and the first item is NJC Associates, Shady Lane. And Michelle, could I ask you to give us an overview on this yeah and i'm going to share my screen as well because this mm. one um is... if any of the applicants are here could you please raise your hand i think they may be via phone michael just so you know no, no one else is dialed in so there there'd be um via the computer or the tablet okay i see somebody from shady lane i'll promote them Okay, I'm gonna share. I'm gonna try to share my screen here. Okay. 
Okay, is Tommy here? Does it look like they're on? Michelle, now? can you hear us now? Yes, yes. Oh, excellent. Sorry about that, guys. So, Tommy, do you want to just walk the board through um, what you're proposing? Um, and I have the I have the plan on the screen. I hope you can see it. Yeah, can. I, I can. I have the plan in front of me. Okay, as well. I'll, I'll point out the the as you're talking. I'll point out um, the areas that you're talking about. Great. So, uh, if you see, I, I've highlighted uh, the plan in different colors. Purple is existing structure. And where Michelle's arrow is, is the, uh, the main, let's say, office building um, with uh, a caretaker's quarters that is above and around the back. All right, like Tommy, let's just let, let's orient everyone where you are. You're on Route 52 across correct. the package pavement. Okay. That is correct. And the use of the site was formerly a nursery. It hasn't correct. been used as a nursery in years. These buildings here that you, they're now um, your offices were um, the former nursery commercial area of the nursery. And then the nursery also had areas in here where they stored materials and sold plants. Correct. Okay. And then there's also a house here, correct? That, that is correct. Pre-existing this, this, this is three parcels. This parcel here is B1 and these two parcels are R3. Um, the house was always located on the, in the B1 zone and, it, and it's been occupied. Um, and then this was, this was really where the greenhouses were in the, um, and the nursery, the main retail portion of the nursery. Correct. So what we're proposing, we're looking for, uh, we're looking to really remedy some violations that are currently um, on the main building or the main office. <clears throat> so uh, some of the violations that are, that are existing are uh, a change in occupancy, um, certificates of occupancy, and a site plan approval for a, uh, let's say a model trailer that they would like to have along the Route 52 corridor. And that's highlighted with the, uh, with the yellow there. As okay, a so you, point so, so you um, the, the site was vacant for a while. You guys purchased it, and you have a business that you want to run out of this location in the B1. That market, is correct. Which is a construction um, rental business. You rent, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, construction trailers and porta potties. That is correct. Service, service, and and basically Merck Powell. They they sell, uh, they sell and uh, buy and sell, and they also uh, rent uh, those units as well. Okay. So this would be your offices. You that is correct. This building is your office. Yep. And, and you'd like, and here you're showing, um, you would like to have some sort of model trailer in this location. Is that? Um, that, that, that is correct. Yeah. So um, model trailer would, would be placed. Uh, there's currently, so on that side of the building, there used to be, um, there used to be three greenhouses in that area. They've since been taken down. Permits were pulled to demo those down uh, back in 2000, I believe 19. Mm -hmm. uh, so those were removed. There is still currently a, um, a large concrete pad there that would house the model trailer. So, uh, you know, people could actually take a look at what the capabilities or the possibilities are um, for the different, uh, let's say, options to fit out the trailers with. Okay, and so, um, and I also just want to talk a little bit about this site. is a is a It's been a tricky site for a long time. Um, there's a lot of pre-existing non-conforming issues on this site. Um, one of the issues is that this road that goes bisects um, the property leads back to uh, two homes and a. Um, Another, another parcel, which is virtually landlocked. Um, so this is the access to, um, to the residences and it goes through straight through the business property. And then I believe in this location, there's a garage where you're currently storing um, porta potties. Correct. They're all indoor at this point? They are not. They are not. Okay, so you've got some outdoor and some indoor. That is correct. Okay, and then, um, 
there's also construction trailers up here? That is correct. Okay. So um, really, th this site, um, you know, we have to think about how, how we're going to handle it, but it's in violation right now um, because they didn't get site plan approval for the, for the business. And um, they did some work on the, this portion of the site to add an accessory uh, uh, apartment, which um, technically can be allowed in a B1 as a caretaker's unit, but they have to go to the zoning board to get that. Um, that approval for a special permit, okay? And then um, we have on this portion of the property, we have some um, uses that aren't typically allowed in a residential zone. So for purposes of tonight, we just wanted to introduce the planning board to this site and um, let them understand what was going on out here it, because it is complicated and to get some feedback about um, the business and, um, you know, it is it is a rental sales business. However, they are also storing equipment, so that has to be understood. And um, this access drive is tricky because it's a little bit steep, and it's not currently it's not paved for any of the length, right? It's pretty much gravel the whole way up. Uh, yeah, recycled material. The grade is um, approximately eleven percent. Okay. I actually, actually, give you that. So hold on one second. What is this structure? Is this a um? shed or something what's this no that's actually a, a two-car garage that's a garage okay yep so it's like a three-car garage at uh over on the r3 property at 16 shady lane mm -hmm. you'll see how that's labeled purple dwelling is a three-car garage the other one on the on the on the b1 property is a two-car garage and then obviously the house is uh further up which is 19 shady lane so even though the 19 Shady Lane and five Shady Lane are on the same, let's say, lot. It's two separate addresses. Okay. And currently so right now, uh, there's the two parcels above uh, these three properties. One is occupied. They have a right of way mm -hmm. for that driveway. And one is unoccupied. It's been uh, in foreclosure for, I don't know, five or some odd years. Um, and the, the bank, you know, we've inquired about it, but the bank has not, uh, have, the bank hasn't responded. The third property at the top of the hill, like you say, is landlocked. They do have uh, a bit of road frontage on uh, Route 52, um, but they do not have a right of way to use that driveway. So currently there are only two right of ways on file. Okay. So Lori, you had a question. I think it was Lori. Yeah, Michelle, I was going to ask, why wouldn't 19 Shady Lane be considered the accessory apartment? It seems like we have now two residences on the business site, right? Well, well yeah, so so um, this this is in front of us because there's violations on the property. So they um, went and put, they put an accessory unit in this location um, without permission or permits or approval. So this house existed and there, this was always rented on the site. Um, and this was just a commercial business. And so, after, so there was always, Michelle, as far as I know, there was always an accessory apartment upstairs from the business. I just don't know if there was a special permit there or not for it. Okay, so you're saying- So it was, it was already existing. Okay, so, so it may have pre-existed. I'm not sure that we have records of that, but it may have pre-existed. I can check right. it for it. Um, so- So um, when you say pre-existed, Michelle, we, we got to go back to 63 to say it has any kind of uh, status. Right. Yeah. We have to see if there was any sort of right. approval granted for it or has any status. But, um, right. you know, there's a cu couple, I mean, obviously they're operating a business out there without any type plan approval. So that's, that, that's one of the issues, but there's a host of issues on the site. And, um, you know, we're, we're kind of looking at it in general because this has been a, a difficult site for a long time now and um we're we're trying to solve some problems here but making sure that it you know is consistent with zoning or um it's consistent with some sort of um approvals that we might be able to grant it so and, and so is there sorry Michelle, Go ahead. I know there was some discussions about a relocation of the driveway for the access to the rear, rear home. 
Yes. So the previous owner. Yes, the previous owner had considered at one point um, taking the driveway and removing it from here and kind of skirting the side of the property like this. Um, you know, having access to here, and that way the this driveway was bisecting the the business. Um, that that was discussed, and um, they you know he sold he ended up selling the property. So um, you know we are we are where we are right now. And um, I you know I mentioned this to to Nancy, and um, I believe it's quite costly to install the driveway. So um, that is not their preference. Is that a so, problem, Michelle, that it bisects the property? I'm not sure I understand what well, brings over to the right. Not, I mean, it's, again, it's pre-existing, but you're not supposed to have a shared driveway that goes through a commercial property to a residence. You're not supposed to go through a commercial right. property to a residence. Yeah, okay. Pre-existing with the nursery, and then nothing was there for more than a year. So I think it's a new ballgame. Michelle, have we looked at rezoning any of this to a different zone? Um, is there any relief there where it becomes more compliant if, for instance, the two R3 maybe move to a B1 zone and maybe you carve out the 19 Shady Lane and make it a lot, a residential lot? That was kind of shifting the zoning? Yeah, that was discussed with the previous owner, potentially carving out the residential lot and, and swapping the the zoning because it does, I mean, it is sort of ironic that this is the B zone and this is the residential zone. Um, that was talked about with the previous owner, but again, we sort of went through a lot of different iterations with the site with the previous owner and then nothing, um, you know, they didn't, I think he, he really wanted to sell um, and um, he eventually did. So nothing got done in that aspect, with that aspect of it. How, how much Michelle? of the non-conforming condition is repaired by making the two lots on the right hand side or easterly side um business b1 instead of r3 well so, some of it is i mean i think this is this classic is this a contractor's yard or is it a rental sales equipment yard you know what i'm saying it's it, this is the kind of thing that we've tossed around before with other projects and um defining this use exactly and whether or not that this use can be in a B1. The storage part, the sales rental can be, that clearly the offices can be in the B1. It's the, it's the storage of the equipment. That's always- well, call, call it, right. a, what is it, an I3 then or something like, I mean, whatever the right zone would be, I think this is a, this is not, a, not an invasive use. I, I get it shouldn't be on a residential parcel, but, um, it feels like there would be something we could do with zoning to allow a business use, which it has been for years, even though not this particular use. Mm -hmm. and, and, and being residential up there, I mean, with package pavement across the street, it's not like that's a neighborhood. Uh, uh, I don't really see a problem with doing some sort of rezoning to get this as good as we can. I mean, the good news is that this is the site sits higher there's, there's residences here, but the site sits higher and above these residences. So we had always talked about potentially having some sort of buffering along here, providing some sort of buffering so that the business can extend beyond a certain point to just give these folks a little bit of, uh, of extra, um, you know, visual and noise um, buffering. But I think that, um, you know, in the large, for a large part, it's, it's not, it's not really um, invasive to the neighbors because they can't really see what's going on up here. So there have so, been no complaints. Um, I've not. I have no no of um, any complaints from these neighbors. I think there have been complaints from folks driving by about the appearance of the site, and there was a trailer out here for a while. So we got some complaints about this construction trailer that was here, um, but I don't know that we've gotten any complaints from about this this area of the site. Was, and that construction trailer has the construction trailer has since been removed. Correct. Until we can come to some kind of agreement uh, about what can be done with that location. 
So, so Michelle, how how wide does the I'm going to call it a flag, but I, I, how wide does a strip of land have to be to be not considered a flag? It has to be, you have to have 50 feet. So it's I thought that was for the oh, flag for, line. It was 50 feet. How how wide would it have to be to not be a flag? Oh, for, for a building lot, you're saying? Yeah. Uh, 125 feet. Because yeah. my thought was, if you could somehow somehow bifurcate the property so that you have business on the right and business in the front and then give the residential lot in the back enough frontage that it could be a shared drive with the lots behind it. It feels like you could do something where we don't have the issue of B1 zoning and on the drive, residential drive, right? If you could make the residential lot include a wide enough strip that it could be a shared drive with the lots behind it mm -hmm. and then have all the rest of it in the front and on the other side be business. You know what I'm getting? Do you, do you see what I'm kind yeah. of getting at? Yeah, we, we, we did sort of try to figure out how that might work, um, you know, with swapping some of the some of the different yeah. districts and looking at different like looking at different districts. Like, should we do this I? Should we do this B? We did. We did think about that, Lori, definitely. Um, and it, I think that does make a certain amount of sense. Um, but but right now, I just wanted to kind of introduce you to the property and have everyone think about it a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, you know they're in they're in violation right now, but because they're in front of us trying to work it out, we're um, we're contemplating what you know what can actually happen on the site. And um, Scott, did you have something else to say? I think you started to say something before. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So Brendan, are you on the line? No, Brendan's not here. I don't think. He dropped off. So my question was, being that it used to be a nursery, I'm not sure what it has in the way of DOT driveway permits, but the fact that we're going from uh, cars to these long construction trailers in and out, I, I think the, the driveway access to the state road should be, you know, clarified with DOT, make sure they don't have any issues with it. So that's a good point, Michelle, too. If we can look at a way to make the residential parcel include the shared drive, we'd have to figure out how that shared drive becomes part of some type of entrance or egress for the B1 parcel as well. Yeah, right? I think that's, um, I think that when they, they actually got to the point where I think they brought it to DOT, the previous owner, and um, they were going to do some sort of. I actually have some plans, which I can I can pass around and show everybody from from when the previous owner kind of drew up a, a concept, and um, they did I think start conversations with DOT about this driveway, this portion of the driveway, and um, I'll just go back in my notes and see what it was, and I'll send that around to everybody and take a look at it. Michelle, I have a question for you, or whoever can answer. The residential lot that's on the property, so the, that one, yeah. um, what is the intention of that and the accessory unit in the main building? Are those intended to be like long-term income producing properties or mm -hmm. is it necessary for employees to stay there for some purpose? What's the long-term idea behind the residential? I'll let you handle this one, Tommy. Yeah, so the 19 Shady Lane, uh, from my understanding, the history is that's always been a house that's been a rental uh, income property. That's how it was uh, presented to us when uh, Nancy had uh, purchased the property. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, the, uh, the living quarters that are above the office are occupied by her daughter. So uh, uh, it's more of like a caretaker's, uh, you know, quarters. And if anybody needed to get into that office, any of her employees or anything else, uh, after hours, um, they could always be let in by the daughter while she's there. So um, if that answers your question, I, I think that that's really where it is. So the 19 Shady is would be income, and the 5 Shady, which is above the office, is really just a caretaker for the office. Now, what about the garage in between? Is that utilized by the 19 Shady Lane? Or is it no. utilized by the five shady lane? It's 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 uh, it's uh, utilized by the business at five shady lane. 
Okay. So they store their paper goods in there uh, and, and yeah. supplies for, for their business. Okay. Um, I know the weather's terrible and it's supposed to be getting worse this week, but this might um, might be a good one for a site visit. Yeah, I agree. I like that. So, um, you know, I think that maybe as soon as there's not a huge amount of snow on the ground, we can try to, and I'll, what I'll do is I'll make a note in my calendar to, um, in about a couple of weeks to sort of reach out and see if we can schedule a site visit. Yeah. Yeah. I have a tendency to agree with Lori though, that I think that we could mitigate some of the issues by redefining the, uh, the zoning for the majority of the property. Um, my only concern is definitely, you know, the activity between the business and then the homes in the back, you know, that there would be, you know, making up the three residential properties, 19 Shady Lane, and then the two that are beyond the uh, green uh, driveway going up. Like, I don't know how that, how that would function because I don't know how active the business would be together with the traffic from the residential down that same driveway. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, we really have to try to understand that whole thing. If we are gonna get involved in, uh, you know, having them pursue uh, change of zoning personally. Yeah, I, I think you have to make sure that that travel way is residential, not business. Yeah. Um, and, and Michelle, correct me, I know that the, the landlock, I'm going to call it the landlock parcel has frontage, but I thought that was unbuildable. I thought, I thought it was inaccessible. So it's really difficult because there, this is a hill right here on Route 52, and then there's some steep slopes, like even I think rock along here. So it's not easy to put, a, or, or it would be very expensive to put a driveway in here. Um, it would involve it significant in cut into the rock there, right? Correct, correct. And I, don't, and I think sight distance might be an issue as well. Um, so, so, so effectively, you've got, two, you've got two lots. So, I'm sorry. sorry Lori. Go ahead, Lori. I was just going to say, so essentially, you have two lots that currently have access to the right of way, and you probably have the third, which I'm going to again call landlocked because of the inaccessibility of their frontage, that, that ideally, we don't want to have a landlocked unusable parcel in the town, right? We want to have it potentially have access here. And, and you know, for the applicant, if you're listening, I, I'm, I'm not committing you to anything. I'm just saying we see an issue as we're looking at zoning and we're looking at some of these changes, there may be a way to give whoever that property owner is some relief. Is that, are the, is it common? Richard, is that what you were asking if it was commonly owned? Yeah, because I'm feeling the same thing. Cause then if let's say further down the road, there is uh, some type of development on that, you know, we'll call it that landlocked piece of property. Then that then there's an additional uptick of activity on that on that right away. Yeah, they wouldn't be able to at, at this point in time. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, Michael. Um, it, this that lot um, was a Christmas tree farm, and I believe it was associated with this lot originally. So he sold it separately. But mm -hmm. my understanding is that they wouldn't even be able to because there's no um, driveway access. They have no access right now. They wouldn't really be able to unless they either created a driveway or got some sort of agreement to use yeah. the road. Michelle, there's not even a driveway that goes into that lot currently, the Christmas tree lot. Like okay. there's, you know, you, you drive up to a certain point and it's just trees growing in the middle of the, you know, it's, it's just, uh, it's, it's barren up there. But I think Lori's point was that we'd like to see something be able to take place there. So, having that all in mind and not obviously Tom committing you to anything, we would have to kind of look at the whole uh, project. We would take that into consideration for sure. Okay. Do, do you know that property owner or are they, they're not related to you? They're not part of? So uh, they're, they're not related to us. Um, there's been some talks between Nancy and the owners. It's from my understanding, two brothers that own that property. And from my understanding, um, one wants to sell and one does not. Uh, we've made an offer on the property, or should I say Nancy has made an offer on the property. And when they come to an agreement, uh, at that point, I believe uh, it would be uh, something that would be, in, would be uh, uh, Nancy would be considering that sale for that person. 
Michelle, how, do you know how large that parcel is? 5.3 acres. Now, let me ask you something. If Nancy were to acquire that property, would that then become, uh, or would you reapproach us to make that parcel part of this project? Um, quite frankly, we haven't thought, or I, at least I haven't, Nance. No, I mean, no, I haven't. Again, there's really no thought about that property. There, there's also property uh, uh, tax lot number 448065, which is, let's say, the, the other second house that has the right of way, it, as I said earlier, has been foreclosed for over five years. We've inquired about that as well um, with no response from the bank. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the only property currently above that green driveway that you see on the sketch plan there is 415070. Um, and uh, we, we have no problems with them whatsoever. Uh, very working uh, well relationship. And uh, there's been no issues uh, up to this date. So, um, Laura, he said the property was five, five plus acres in the back. Um, but, so, but not six. So it's one lot at best, right? If it's R3? It's R3, yeah. Okay. So um, I think maybe the, we can table the discussion for now and try to set up a schedule of site visits here out there. I agree. Yeah, Michelle, there was a question in the chat, I think from Pete said his, um, Pete Sotero said his uh, internet connection is. Yeah, I don't know. Can you hear me? Yes, we can now. Yep. All right. Well, we'll try it. I'm sorry, but my internet like connection, you know, is terrible. So I turned off my video. Um, so, you know, hopefully, hopefully it lasts. So maybe the applicant can explain how the porta potty rental you know, business, um, you know, works that I work with a local um, sanitation company. Um, I have some experience in uh, a neighboring town as the engineer to the, to the planning board where there's uh, an application from a local um, sanitation company to, to uh, locate their yard there and also store, you know, quite a few um, porta potties. And there's uh, a lot of concern from, you know, the neighbors in terms of you know the porta potties and are they you know how are they how are they cleaned and you know are they you know they're pumped out before they come back to the site so maybe the applicant can kind of explain how that part of the business works. Yeah, the porta johns are cleaned before they come before they're actually on the truck for DOT. We have to have them cleaned before they even get on the road. So they're pumped before they um, they leave the site. They come back to us and then we just store them neatly in the yard. They are cleaned and they get prepared, ready to go to the next rental. So they're clean and they're sanitized on site as soon as we get them. That includes the trucks as well. So the, the trucks have to empty daily. So they, they empty uh, at the waste stations um, prior to coming back to the yard. So there's there's never any waste in the trucks or the Porta Johns uh, when they enter the site. So do you have any, do you, are, are there going to be any uh, waste hauling trucks that are going to be parked overnight there? Correct. Correct. Yes. Yes, they are. The pump trucks are parked overnight there. Okay. Well, that is a little bit of you know, a concern, especially with the neighbors being on, you know, wells and such. So. Again, uh, always empty before they get to us because we hold I, water. They have to be empty because overnight they'll freeze. I so understand. Get everything out. Yeah, I mean that's that's the that's 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 the same as I understand it in this other application that I'm like reviewing. But you know, as we get into it, it's just something we're going to have to go uh, and look at, and there's going to have to be uh, a lot uh, of notes that are placed that are placed on the plan um, as to you know how they're how they're like cleaned, um, so that we can make sure. Not saying that you're going to you know like do it, but if there is anything that you know if there is any cleaning that goes on on the site and you know, we just want to make sure that, you know, we're covered so that if, that if the town needs to uh, enforce anything, uh, that we have the appropriate notes on the map, you know, like to do that. So that's fair. Yeah. That's just something that we'll have to work out. I mean, and um, is there any way to store the, uh, there, there isn't any way the waste hauling trucks can be. So do you actually have your own, your own waste hauling business? Of course. Yes. Okay. All right. I didn't know that. So all right, so that's just something we'll have to go work through. That's all. Included in the application, uh, there was a um, introduction to the business, to NJNC Associates, 
uh, not only that with a site map and some other stuff. I'm not sure if you got that or not, but no, we haven't seen it yet. You know, the consultants haven't seen it because I think this is just the initial, um, the initial sketch plan. Yep. I don't think that we got it, did we, Michelle or Jackie? Um, I don't think so. Okay. No, you didn't get it. Okay. I have it. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> well, so again, this that's is just the sketch discussion, right? So there's no. That's right. Right. No professional review yet. Right. right. Yeah, exactly. but it was just something as we had our uh, agenda call last week, and I have some, um, you know, familiarity with, you know, a similar application in you know, another town. It's just, there's just some things we just need to work through. That's all. Okay. Now, does Thanks, this operation Peter. exist at another site currently? We have two yards in New York City. In New York City. And nothing, though, in Dutchess County? No. Okay. I thought you worked out of Carmel at one point. We worked out of Carmel. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, in Carmel we had, and we moved from Fair Street, from 9 Fair Street to Shady Lane. So, out of curiosity, how many, um, how, how, how many porta potties do you think, you know, would be here at one time? For the most part, not many, because most of them are on rent. Um, so I would say any given time, maybe between 25 and 30 will be on site and the rest of them are all in rentals. And we specialize in heavy highway construction. So usually we rent a large quantity at a time and they're out there on the job sites for anywhere between six months and three years, depending on the size of the, of the construction. There could be 30 in the yard today. There could be five in the yard tomorrow at any given time. And aside from the individual porta johns, do you have any larger structures. I know like they have yeah, some of these yeah. portable the bathrooms. Trailers. So they you could. have the trailers too. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. How much of the construction and outfitting of the trailers is being done on site at any given time? Uh, they're basically cosmetic, um, cosmetic renovations, which would be paint, flooring, uh, maybe a window if there was a broken piece of glass or something like that. So you're basically buying the units already constructed and then just- They're standard making... units, yes. They're okay. standard units that have um, two offices on each side and an empty space in the middle, a standard construction field office trailer. And again, we buy them and they come back to us sometimes a little beat up. We just do some cosmetic, get it ready for the next rental. Very well. Right, so if it's, if it's okay with you, Tommy and Nancy, I'll probably try to contact you as soon as we get rid of some of the snow and it makes sense to go out and do a site visit. Absolutely. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, and then um, I'll send an email around to the planning board and we can we can go out and, and check out the site. I think it'll make a lot more sense once you're there. Yep, sure. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Tommy and Nancy. Appreciate it. Thank no, you. thank you for your time. We appreciate you. We'll look forward to coming out. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks. So the next item on the agenda is Valley Pediatric. And do we have someone representing the applicant available? Okay, Rich, uh, you're able to speak. Uh, yes, uh, this is Rich Tompkins with Mori Architects. There we go. Um, so uh, we are here this evening. Uh, this building is an existing dental office um, and we are looking to move a new dental office in. And we do have um, some additional square footage in the basement that was vacant that we plan on using for the offices. Do you um, have a plan that you can share? Do, would you like me to pull it up on the screen? Um, I do have a plan I could share. Perfect. So, um, okay. Sorry about that, there we go. So the existing site, again, there's an existing dental office on site with parking and all the other site uh, amenities, lighting, landscaping. Um, there is currently a, um, 
ramp that is on the east side of the building, uh, a handicap ramp, and there is a front porch and stairs, which is the main entrance uh, on the west side of the building. Um, we are proposing on the proposed site here, uh, a new handicap ramp and deck, um, again, on the east side of the building. Uh, the existing handicap ramp really doesn't meet handicap accessibility requirements. Um, and obviously with some of the renovations that we're doing in the basement uh, with the new building codes would require that to be brought up to code, um, as well as providing an additional handicap ramp, uh, which is on the west side of the building. Um, <clears throat> again, where the main entrance is with the parking. Um, so those basically are the exterior renovations that we plan on making to this uh, application. On the north side of the building, which is the right side, uh, there is a exit stair from the basement level. Um, unfortunately, the, the, the risers um, do not meet code requirements and the width do not meet code requirements. So we would be rebuilding that. So again, that's a dug out of the ground uh, because the basement level is, is basically a flight below grade there. Um, one of the other things that we plan on doing, the existing septic system is located in the front yard. Um, we are planning to abandon that um, and connect to the town sewer connection um, so that we don't have to worry about septic issues in the future. Could you just talk a little bit about the administrative offices and so the basement currently in the existing building is is it um, unused or is it even um, is it is it a full basement or is it what are you what kind of renovations are you doing down there and what are you planning to do down there? Sure. Yeah. So the 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 existing building is about thirty two hundred square feet per floor um, and the existing lower level does have some finished space and mechanical space now um, and then about fourteen hundred square feet is unfinished. Um, so we are planning on finishing the 1,400 square feet. Uh, and, and again, it's just going to be administrative offices. Uh, the majority of the space in the basement is an open floor plan with just office cubicles. Um, we have two enclosed uh, offices and a, and a small call center um, to, to deal with the, any, any daily phone calls. With regards to egress in the basement, is that one single... Uh, space that's facing Route 376, it's only egress? Yes, that would only be egress, correct. And so aside from that, is there any other emergency egress on any of the other sides of the building? Uh, so we have uh, a, a new exit stair that's going to be constructed inside, um, and that is going to be located on the west side where the main entrance is located. But that's... So exit through the first floor, not to the outside. So the, the exit stair uh, will have a direct exit to the front porch. Okay. So on that front porch, we're relocating uh, the existing entrance um, about eight feet or so. Um, and then we will have a second um, means of egress door to that, to that uh, uh, covered porch. So aside from that, is it just like any type of... Uh eyebrow windows or anything that are, uh, you know, have light into that basement or is it just those areas? Uh, so uh, along um, the north and south walls, uh, there are a few windows uh, that are existing into that space. So it will have natural light into that space. Okay. That's one of the reasons that we're trying to keep it as an open floor plan so that we don't close it um, sure. You know, enclose it with small offices. And I missed why you have two different handicap accesses on different sides of the building. Is it because of separate offices that need to be accessed? Uh, no. So on the west side, again, which is near the parking area, that's the main entrance. So uh, it's, it's two reasons. One for entrance purposes, uh, so we have handicap accessibility, but also both exits are required to be accessible. So we do have, there's an existing exit that is on the east side of the building, which is facing J Lane. Um, so again, we're rebuilding that handicap ramp because currently it really doesn't meet handicap accessibility codes. 
Uh, so that's the reason for the one on J lane. And, and again, the one near the front entrance is really an entrance ramp as well as an egress ramp. And your handicap parking is located near both of those ramps? Uh, well, again, the, the, the ramp uh, along, J, uh, along the east side, which is J lane, uh, is strictly going to be exiting. So we don't anticipate anybody using that ramp to come in the building. Um, as you can see uh, in the um, upper left corner of the plan, uh, there's two handicap parking spaces. Got it. Now, is the parking that you have on the plan match what's there today, or is this expanded upon? Uh, so that is the existing layout today. Um, we really are just planning on uh, sealing and restriping uh, the existing pavement. So we would put back the same number of spaces. Okay. So I have if you if you do that, it might make sense for you to move one of your this handicap space over here, which you're going to mm -hmm. restrike over onto this side where the entrance is. Right. Yeah, we, we, we have thought about that a little bit. The, the only issue is the existing uh, depression for the curb is in the corner. That's why the two uh, striped spaces are there. Um, we did think about trying to combine it so we have one striped space. We'd actually increase the parking by a space. Um, we just have to look at how that reconfigures the front sidewalk near the stair. So and Michelle, um, did, did you say you already looked at the parking calculation here for I this did. with the chain? Okay. Yes, yeah, I did. And they need about 35 spaces and they're providing 38. And that's 35, including the new office space with Correct. the additional employees. Correct. I'm assuming it's going to be more employees, right? Than previously, I believe so, yes. I don't, I'm not exactly sure what the, the it's a, it's a completely different practice. The practice, old practice moved down. This is a new practice coming in. So I don't know what the number of dentists were there before, but they provided me with a number of suites and the number of employees and I calculated the, the parking. Is the change of an entrance like this the, with the with the accessibility, is that considered a minor action, Michelle, since it's so yes, yeah, so this this one, just so you know, it yes, it's 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 a minor amendment to the site plan. There was no existing site plan on record in our office. So um, and they were adding, they were making some modifications, obviously, that um, were new on the site plan. And they were also adding space in the um, basement. So we, um, we asked that they provide us with a, with a site plan showing all those changes. So does this include the lighting locations and things like that, too? I'm assuming nothing else needs to change. Everything else is staying the same. Correct. And they, I asked about the signage. The sign is just going to be replaced in the existing location. Okay, no change to landscaping or anything like that? No chance, no, not that I know of, no. Yeah, we're, we're really not changing any of the lighting or landscaping. There is a little bit of landscaping, some bushes that are uh, on the north side of the building by the exit stair from the basement that may have to be relocated just to make that stair wider or, or removed, I should say. Um, and there's a few bushes um, that are in front of the ramp along J Lane. Um, and because that ramp is being made a little wider, um, those would also have to be removed, but they're just small bushes there. Are you, are you going to replant them out further? Uh, I'm not sure if we'll be able to re relocate them or not. We hadn't on the- Well, you're abandoning the septic area, right? So that should- We are. Uh, I don't have it on the plan to, to put new bushes there, but it's something we, we certainly could do. Where is the existing refuse container on this site? Is there an- uh, There really isn't a location for one currently. Are you gonna have one? Um, we haven't discussed that, whether we need a, an actual large dumpster or, or if we can, um, you know, get away with using a small residential style, you know, dumpster that just gets pulled out to the, to the drive. We, we haven't just really discussed the details of the, of, of, of that yet. Okay. So if you decide that you have to have a refuse container, it has to be shown on the site plan. Yes. Right. Um, so there's a Any couple different questions? places it could probably fit, Michelle. I, I, there seems to be space. Mm -hmm. I would think with the um, uptick employees that it would probably be some type of requirement. But um, the thing is, I mean, 
you have to be a little bit careful because this is the frontage of Route 376. This is where the refuse container would have to be screened, either with fencing or, or landscaping, if you were going to put it on. Um, and, and you don't want to be too close to any of the resident the residences because it can be noisy. So um, it would be helpful to know if you're going to plan to do that, to add a refuse container so we could think about the best location for it. We can do that. What should we uh, make that a condition? Um, I, think, I think we should, yeah. Review that with, with you as town planner. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we can we can provide you with a sketch for that so we can look at it. And then maybe also, Michelle, the replacement of the screening where the uh, bushes are being removed right now on the east side. Yes. That, that's front. It looks like that's frontage to J Lane, invisible from three seventy six. Yep. So are, are you were looking to replace the bushes just on the east side, which would be J Lane. Do you want uh, bushes then replaced also where we're removing them uh, on the north side, which is also 376? Oh, I thought you said you were replacing those bushes. Uh, no, I, I, I misspoke when I first said that. We would be removing those. But if, if it's possible, we could try to see if we can just move them uh, same, uh, same you know, for the ramp on the east side. We, we, could look, we could look at seeing if we could remove them or uh, replace them. Or, or you know, just put something new in there. That, that's fine. We could, we could look at either one. You might be a little tight with your dry. That might have to be like a planter or something. Maybe that's just a seasonal thing. Right. Something. Um, what, what about ARB? This isn't changing the profile of the building. You're not changing the color of the building or anything like that. Well, the existing, the existing building's brick. Um, so we don't obviously plan on changing anything with that. Again, we're, we're moving a couple of doors in the front. Um, and I think on the south side, we have a couple of window sizes that change. Uh, but other than that, we're, we're, we're not planning on changing the color or doing anything to the exterior. But the character, the color, everything stays the same. Everything would stay the same, correct. Yeah, whatever windows we put in would match the existing windows that are there. Any other questions or comments? Then with, unless there's objection, we'll proceed to a resolution. Uh, Lori, G, could you please read the resolution? Sure. Uh, resolution of amended site plan approval for the Valley Pediatric Dentistry with an applicant of Robert Horahan located at 1557 Route 82 East Fishkill uh, offered by Lori G. Whereas the above referenced applicant applied to the town of East Fishkill Planning Board for an amended site plan approval for an existing dental office. And whereas the applicant is proposing to add administrative offices in the basement of the existing building and construct handicapped ramps at the east and west building entrances to meet building code requirements. Whereas the site has 38 parking spaces and contains sufficient parking to accommodate the dental practice and the addition of the basement administrative offices. And whereas the proposed action is a type two action under seeker and no further review is required. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the planning, oh, uh, planning board, sorry, approves the site plan submitted by the applicants professional, Mori Architects PC, dated February 8th, 2021. And I think Michelle will have to add the, and yeah, this Mori. approval shall be subject to the following Correct. Uh, conditions. Correct, that's where we'll add the uh, refuse container. Um, location of the refuse container to be identified on the site plan and also um, the landscape screening to be reviewed with the town planner and placed on the plan. Any other conditions, Michelle? I don't, I didn't hear any other. I didn't hear any other. Okay. okay. Get further, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Be it further resolved, sorry, John. Be it further right. resolved that within five business days of the adoption of this resolution, the chair or other duly authorized member of the planning board shall cause a copy of this resolution to be filed with the town clerk and a copy sent to the applicant owner. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Richard. Uh, vote serves follows. Board member Lori G. Aye. Board member John Cut Cutler, excuse me, he's not here. Board member Ed Miyoshi. Aye. Board member Sarah Bledsoe. Aye. Uh, board member Richard Campbell. 
Aye. Chairperson John Eichmann, I'm an aye. It passes. Great. Thank you very much for your time tonight. Thank you, Rich. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. The next item on the agenda is 75 Harrigan Road. Uh, and is this something, Michelle, would we do well to ask you for a, kind of a brief overview of what we're looking at? Sure. Um, and is the applicant here? I believe I saw. I thought I saw someone. Uh, there's... If you're here for this application, can you please hit the, yes, we've had somebody raise their hand. Great. And I guess I, I'm going to share my screen um, to show the plan. Yeah, she just sent a note that said she's here, but some for some reason can't connect. Well, Mr. Basket, you should be able to connect now. I right, and you're muted. Louise. Okay, I'm not there muted anymore. Hello, yeah. everyone. Welcome. Thank you. I'm actually hiding in my attic because of three dogs, so don't mind the Christmas tree behind me. <laughs> okay, so I just I'm sharing my screen so we can pull up the um the Thank you. here. And I'll try to use the cursor to point out what you're talking about. Okay, great. Thank you, Michelle. Okay, so you want to just give a little, so this is a, I'll give a little background and then um, and you can correct me if I say anything wrong, but this parcel here was, um, I guess back in, I don't know when it was in the 80s or 70s, I have no idea when exactly, there was a proposed um, Dutchess County like through you're highway. talking about County Route 11? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Back here. And um, this was a, this subdivision um, had a, I guess it was sort of like a paper road. And again, Michael, jump in if I'm saying anything wrong. There was a, a, a paper road here and, um, and this highway that was supposed to go back behind these lots. Um, so when this subdivision was initially contemplated, this was not a buildable lot as part of the subdivision. Um, it's 10.9 acres um, and um, the applicant is requesting that the planning board consider um, approving this as a buildable lot, basically. And there's, just so, so you know, I'm gonna point out there's a little bit of a drainage area here. So um, I don't know exactly how it's, how it, functions now, but I think there will have to be some sort of crossing here of some sort of drainage that goes like this. You can see it on the aerial and I also saw it on a on a the filed map as well. How how is it zoned, Michelle? This is all R R1. Okay. And um, you know, this this paper road here goes in between these two lots. 32 and 33. So is that the access to the lot from there? So I think, I think, um, why don't, um, Lisa, why don't you talk about, there's, I think there's another also location where there's potential access to, oh, right? Okay. Yes. So if you were to slide this down, you should be able to see a third access. Um, so this is a 10.9 acre lot. It has a flag lot entrance off Harrigan Road, giving it the address of 75 Harrigan Road. That being said, it's a very difficult access. It's the grade is too high. It goes over wetlands. Then once you get over the wetlands, you'd have to chisel into a mountain ledge. And when you got to the top of that, where the property would begin, to start the 10 acres, it's only 152 feet wide and would make for a very difficult home site. Because it is so large, I did a little bit of digging and found that there are two paper roads on filed maps from 1982 that would give me access. 
the one that I would prefer to use, which seems to make the most sense, would be the one where she just had her cursor. Right here. There you go. Yes. Um, I thought it was around 36 or 38. You could be correct. I don't have my glasses on to see this tiny. Yes. Okay. So there we go. 32. It says, it says 33 and 32, but I think the mailbox is actually like 38, but we get the idea. It's that one. There is another entrance. If you go up a little further around that right here. Yep. Perfect. I'm trying to see the numbers. Uh, 40 and 41. 40 and 41. Okay. Um, which again is mailbox number 16 or something. I would prefer to come in off flower at the ladder um, near the 30s because it already is cleared for the most part. Um, it's cleared, it's been driven on, it's marked, and when I would come in off that side, the property is 252 feet wide. It would be a better home site. I'm only gonna build one home on this. It's gonna be a family homestead. And that part of the property would give everybody involved, including myself, the most privacy. It's wooded, it's in the back. There's that other little thumbprint where it says reserved extension strip, not a buildable lot, that little tiny like postage stamp over there. Again, it gives more of a buffer for any of the surrounding neighbors. And um, it would just be an easier entrance, an easier driveway, it's one house, more taxes for the community to collect. And uh, I'd like to make my way back into Dutchess County. Is there a map that shows this, um, Michelle, with a little bit less detail and a little bit higher out so we can kind of see the whole lay of the land a little bit? Well, let me stop sharing my screen. We do have a, the file. Hold on one second. I might have a little bit of a better one. Um, Michelle, I think the tax map shows it very clear. If you can pull up the Dutchess County parcel map. Yeah, I can pull up parcel map. So. It, it doesn't have all the writing on it and it's very clear. Um, I don't believe he's in this Zoom meeting, but I spoke at length last week to Ray Kronizer. Is he here today? Because I thought he might have been. No. no, he doesn't attend these meetings. Okay. Um, and once he and I actually had the opportunity to speak, he even thought this wouldn't be objectionable coming in off flower using the filed paper. 50 feet and coming in that way. We talked about setbacks. I'm not building a large house. So we've got plenty of room on 10 acres to put a, you know, a small house. So how is that paper street owned currently? Well, interestingly enough, um, it was dedicated. It was, I'm sorry, I should back up. It was going to be dedicated to the town of East Fishkill at a planning board meeting many moons ago, but the town denied the dedication. So it went back to the original developer. The 10.9 acres being the last lot of the developer, it seems went back to those legs, I'm gonna call them, went back to the original lot. What would you be, so I'm sorry, and again, maybe when we see the larger map, that'll I'm coming, make I'm more coming. sense. But, but why yeah, I believe... would you have two houses? If you have 10 uh, acres and you have two access points that work. Oh, let me tell you, I would love to give half of it to my mother and half of it to me, but you guys said no. Well, not yet. I, mean, we haven't. I, I don't, you're in front of the planning board for the first time, so I'm not sure I understand. But I, I, I think she's okay. talking about the setbacks with the only 100 foot uh, right. corridor there rather than the 250 on the far end. Mm -hmm. uh, well, no, actually, to be honest with you, I went to your building department about nine or 10 months ago, and I was pretty much told flat out, no, I'm pretty stubborn <laughs> and I really wanted this lot. So I kept digging and I spent three hours going back. I must've read 22 deeds and found this 
filed paper map, the roads, the deeds, and came back to you guys a few months later. And then Corona happened and here we are. But I, yeah, in a perfect world, I would love to split it in half and give my mother one five acre parcel and I would take the other and I would be tickled pink. So Louise, how have those roadways been maintained then? Have they, have they been maintained by the adjacent property owners? No, well, um, one of the property owners near, I'm gonna call it mailbox 16 or that 4041. Uh, you can actually, if you drive by it, they mow it as a lawn and but yet they also drive down it there's like in the summer i spent a lot of time looking at the property and walking the property um to get to know it to see where the best place would be to build and you know to also keep the privacy that people are used to and give myself some privacy too um so maintaining it they're they're mowing it as a lawn um down there and then further down near the the 30s um, pretty much it's just like a dirt path. Hmm. So, so how, how do you propose to gain ownership of that so that you could use it for access? Well, it's my understanding and the understanding of my attorneys. I don't have to gain ownership. It's actually ours because when it was proposed to be dedicated to the town of East Fishgill, they said no. So if we offered it, if there was an offer of dedication, and again, I'm new at this, but if there was an offer of dedication and you said no, then obviously it didn't get dedicated. It stayed attached to that. One outstanding issue is if that little, I guess what we're calling the paper street, if the adjacent neighbors were maintaining it, they may have ownership of it now by adverse possession. Well, no, they would have to start. Okay, so they would have to start an adverse possession and if they did start an adverse possession, I would be one of the people that would be objecting to their adverse possession because they've had 10, 20, 30 years to do something about it. And now that I'm trying to develop the property, they would have no right to it unless I didn't object. And I know this for a fact because I just finished an adverse possession in Catskill. But is that a separate parcel that... that road or no, that no sbl there's nothing it's just it was on it was a, on a filed it was a map. proposed dedication that never happened so it probably does revert back right i would think doesn't it revert back to ownership of the township or does it revert back to the ownership town denied of it the town denied it yeah but if they deny it and they don't if it's separate and they didn't pay the taxes on it don't doesn't the town take it back just by there is no okay i think you're misunderstanding um someone drew this map and did a great job and proposed a dedication the dedication was denied we're clear on that now they should have probably redone the map before they filed it but it was 1982 and they didn't. But that goes, that 50, both 50 feet right of ways go up and around. Can you, um, I'm just trying to see, Michelle? Yep. This one, if you can blow it all the way up, you actually can see, I don't know if everybody can follow me. If you start at the lower, I'm gonna call it the lower leg and you go all the way up, you'll see that it then goes up and around like a horseshoe. So if you follow lots 38, I mean, 35, 34. What, what's the width of it there? Do you know? Is it it's approximately 25 feet. Okay. I was on the computer today trying to measure it so I'd be able to answer you these questions. Yeah. So it comes up and around. Um, based on right the there, it stops right there, Michelle. That's where that's the horseshoe that she's talking about. Yeah, right. So yeah, come back down, down a little bit. Back back down. Down. Other way, other way. Oh, <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> One more. A little more. There we right go. Right there, that little rounded piece that also goes out to Harrigan. That starts no, the horseshoe. No, no, no. That goes out. If you follow that, it goes down to flower again. Right. Or flower. Sorry. Yeah. It's okay. I just want to well, make sure. Let me ask you something. Who's who has ownership of that entire horseshoe? 
That's what I'm trying to tell you. It reverts back to me, the 10.9. Well, you have a it's, title report it's not that? mapped that way. That's what I'm saying. So to me, I, there's a there's a question here as to, you know, ownership of that. Yeah, if it's it's not included on your deed, I would guess, right, Louise? Right. Um, I haven't gotten the title report back yet. I'm supposed to close any day now. Okay. And I've been in contract, you know, I was kind of hoping. I would have had this resolved before I closed, but now I'm going to bite the bullet and close because um, time is of the essence. But so your survey would show if you own that property. I'm told I haven't had a survey done, but I am told by all of the reading and all of the information that I have gathered over the last 10 months or so based on the planning board notes that I sat in the town hall with someone, Michelle, was it you? I was there one, one time when you were there. One time. Um, I went a couple times and the, based on all of the reading and the notes, it went back to the original owner of, I believe it was called First Duchess Estates. And this is the remaining lands of First Duchess Estates. So I but, think, but it would be that's, that's more of a legal question. You have question a closing though, whether... on a piece of property, and you get a survey. There's no, there's no expansion on it. The survey tells you exactly the the lot lines and and their directions, and it, it doesn't change. Oh, okay, it, it I understand depends. what you're saying, but well, what? Question. Well, wait a minute, but but it's a legal issue, right? That you would have to deal with a legal issue. The planning board would have right. no purview to give you that land. You would have right. to deal with that from a legal perspective, okay. right? So, so I, here, here's what I'm saying. At this point, I don't care if I own that land or if I don't own that land. There is law, Mr. Cunningham, you still on? Yes. Okay. I have been told that a property that has a border on a paper road, on a filed recorded map that leads to a public road is allowed to have access over it as an easement or right of way. So okay. even if I couldn't prove ownership, which I'm pretty sure I can, but even if I couldn't, based on that law alone, I should be able to use either one of those paper roads to access my parcel. Lori, there's a Lori here, right? You were talking about a landlocked parcel in a, a sketch plan one or two ago. Mm -hmm. Same idea here. Well, not a, uh, not because there was a right of way that. So that Michelle, can you go now that. all the way up to the top? Let's just zoom in. I think you said there's a hardship for building the access where it's currently assigned. It's so bad. It would cost more than the house itself okay so I it's a similar get, concept yeah i would have to get like dec i mean there's water there's there's you name it yeah um, i mean to, to be to be very very clear though this situation is not the same as the prior one although it's it's a similar type of situation it's not the yes. same condition this being less buildable you would have to pursue your ability to access through a paper road michael i don't know I don't know the law. I don't know that the planning board would have purview over that, right? So no, I, I think she'd have to confirm that, you know, I think Mr. Basket would have to confirm that she has rights to it too, because I'm not saying this access that we're showing now, but before I think the owners, they're not going to claim adverse possession. They're, they may also claim in their deeds, they have a right to the center line of any street that they abut. That's in most deeds. So um, I, th I think Mr. Basket, I think there are a few things if, you know, if you really haven't closed, I think there's some immense difficulties with this lot. And I, I want to put that out there. You know, if you're making a business decision, I, I want this to be clear at this initial meeting. I think there are access issues. And I think there are also potential title issues. And I think there are also engineering issues as well. And I'm not necessarily going to opine on the engineering specifics, but there's a section in the code, section 16319. And it lists all these requirements for a lot. And I don't know if you've engaged a professional yet, but I'm not sure just from a plain reading that you'll be able to meet all of these. Yes, I've already actually con consulted with an engineer. We've looked at the lot um, in detail. And 
yeah, my only obstacle based on that code is you guys recognizing my rights on the paper road. Michael, can I ask a question real quick? Sure. If the intention of this, call it parcel from day one was that it was the road, how can it be considered a lot at this point? So right it was now it's not a buildable lot. And that's why Ms. Rabass goes before you because the planning board have to determine that it is a buildable lot and meets all the requirements of the code. So yes, that's your question. the inspector felt completely differently. So the question that we're trying to figure out right now is if we want to grant her access to this as a buildable lot to determine that it's a buildable lot. Yes, yes. I need mean, to fully engineer drawings. It'll have to be reviewed by Scott, our engineer, and our consultants to make sure it complies with our code. Yeah, I mean, this is just a sketch but, plan. We're but, not making any commitments right now, just to be very clear, right? We're just looking at this as a sketch. Right, because, I mean, right, the, way I would, the way I would look at it simply is when this um, subdivision, was, when this was subdivided, all of these lots were considered as buildable lots under seeker, right? They they did their analysis of these being house lots. This was intended to be a road. But right. if I may, okay. Michelle, nowhere on the final subdivision map does it state that those remaining lands are not to be built on. Nowhere in the final no, subdivision but it doesn't. Map does but it, it wasn't that. designated as a lot either. It wasn't designated as a lot either. Well, it also wasn't designated as a road on the final map. It doesn't say it's going to be a road. I'll pull up the final map because I think um, that one was. The well, while you're doing that, Michelle, um, I want, um, you know, in regards I mean, I'm not, to. Listen, I'm not trying to be combative. I'm just, I, I mean, I've spent hours and hours mm -hmm. reading everything about this lot. Okay, well, what I was going to say was um, um, Scott and I, we were discussing various projects, um, you know, today, and we, we, we talked about this one, like, briefly. So, um, back in the day, uh, you know, I don't know when this was um, subdivided, but there's currently a health department um, regulation that um, says that you can have um, 49 uh, building lots without having to um, have central have the lots connected to central water uh, and sewer. So we would just have to take a look at the filed map and to make sure that there wasn't any um, notes on there or anything. I, I don't know if there's like records of the prior health department uh, approval, but there, that would but that would uh, like prohibit that lot from being like built on because of the fact that at the time that there was uh, a regulation against, uh, that there was uh, a regulation in pl place that only allowed 49 lots without having to provide central water and sewer. So, you know, we'll just have to go through the file, you know, so, map. So Peter, are you saying that original subdivision was 49 lots, not including yeah, this that's one? that's correct. Yeah, yeah, it's 49 lots. Yeah. Not right. including this lot. Right, exactly. So. Right, because they had this lot having access off Harrigan. I'm just saying that having me come off Harrigan. Well, the, the, ac the access road wouldn't wouldn't matter in terms of the particular um, part of the code that Peter is he is referencing right now. That that's that has yeah. to do with the total number of lots within the entire subdivision, regardless of ac access points. You know, and I don't know, I don't know whether that requirement was in place when this was subdivided. That's just something that would have to be looked at. That's but, but, but you would think if it's 49 lots, it probably was. Uh, yeah, I mean, right, right. You would think so. But Peter. Yes. If what Lori's saying is by giving me access through flower, but leaving the legal address as 75 Harrigan. I don't have a problem keeping my mailbox at 75 Harrigan. I just want to be able to get in where it makes more sense. Yeah, but this again, is, this has, is something different. This isn't this, this, this isn't is about the access this point. Different. This is literally about whether or not a 50th well and septic can be placed within this body of land that has already been subdivided. Well said. Okay. It's different than the access point issue. So what, what he's bringing to your attention is you have a different issue with the health department that and with our code that you would need to explore and make sure you're comfortable with. Um, 
which is fine. Before, you, I before you'd be able to move forward. And there is a crossing here of a, of a of some sort of stream. This is a this is marked as an intermittent stream here. I can see it on the um, aerial, and it looks like I don't know if a culvert was ever stuck in here, but it looks like there'd have to be some sort of crossing of a water. Can you use the pointer again? Where are you saying? Right here. There's a culvert, and this is it's this is they're calling this an intermittent stream. I don't know right. what it looks like now, but. Um. It just looks a little bit wet. I mean, I walked it just before the last snowfall and um, it wasn't swampy or anything like that. It just, you know, it looked like a little stream. But there's a permit required if you're gonna cross that. And if, if, if But I'm not there. gonna cross it. If your driveway comes down here, you're gonna have to cross it. Oh, wait, you know what, I'm, I apologize. My, the way it's looking on my phone, it was upside down. So I do apologize. Yes, I would come right in and then I would hang right over to where pretty much where it says to the west, the house would be right about at the. Mm -hmm. What way would you orient it? Where would it face? Um, I would like to have the house face so that the backyard would be two and the front yard would be west. So that I'm not looking at anybody's backyard and they're not looking at mine. You know, my intention is to keep as many trees as possible. Um, I, I really want privacy and I want to also give the people around me privacy. So Michelle, are we saying this is buildable right now as it stands? No, no, we haven't, no, we haven't made that determination yet. Okay. No, I mean, I, I, I mean, I don't, as I said before, I don't know that it ever went, underwent any sort of seeker as a, as a lot. And um, we, we don't even know, I mean, based on, we haven't looked at any of the um, sense, environmentally sensitive lands or any of that kind of thing. So I don't know if the, you know, all the engineering. Yeah, and I, I do see some pretty tight topo lines towards the middle there. And that's why I was saying it's going to be very, very difficult to come in that way and then to build over there. And it's going to be so tight. It's not a buildable lot. So I don't know what that means. I don't, I don't know what that means legally about a driveway crossing this. I don't okay. There's, or if so, if you look at it, there's kind of a dot dash. Do you yep. see the dot dash? So that little like postage stamp to the right, they're saying that that area can't be built on. Because the way they proposed the road to go through it, again, from what I was told, um, this road was gonna possibly, in fact, Michelle, you might've been the one that told me, this road was possibly gonna go into the subdivision that's over this line that actually there's a cul-de-sac in. So this road was potentially gonna go from Flower into almost towards Palin Road. There's a little cul-de-sac. Dakota Drive? Uh, I, don't, I, I don't know the name of the road. There's like That's a cul so Where was this road supposed to start and stop? Like, was there originally intended to be access from Flower Road onto this road? No, if this was supposed to be part of County Route 11, County Route 11 was looking to basically route traffic from IBM up to Poughkeepsie right. back in the early 80s. They were talking about using some of this railroad line that was uh, later turned into the uh, rail trail, oh, but they were right. going to connect it from IBM to get over to there. As I recall, a lot of the neighbors uh, that this was going to go in the back of were very upset and uh, protested against it. And eventually uh, the plan went away. They decided not to move forward. And now we have a rail trail instead. So this preferred access from Flower Road onto this lot. So that first one, was that intended to actually be an access to the lot or road? Looks like uh, it. Well, I wasn't around then. Um, it's a great question. Um, yeah, I don't know what these paper roads are or why they were put there. I don't know. Michelle, it, can you read what it says on that little extension? It says something like strip reserved for 
yeah. flower 55 50 wide strip reserved for future mm -hmm. road future road so it isn't it was intended to be a road connection sarah yep 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 and then uh, that lot, at least that end of the lot, would have very easily have been accessed. Well, I think it would have accessed what would have become a road at that point, right? It would have, from what Ed is saying. Right. It, yeah. it wasn't, it wasn't highway, necessarily intended to access, access residential roads. It was it, residential houses. It was intended to access the new um, County Route 11, if that's the thing. Well, I was also told that it was going to go across the property and into what's looking like Frederick and Lewis, Richard Dudley, Lord Griffin. There's there was there's housing behind the Flower Lane development. In between Flower Lane and Palin Road is another development, another subdivision. Right around where it, this reserved extension strip is, there's a cul-de-sac on the other side. So Michelle, can you switch over to that other map that zoomed out a little bit again? It's you want the aerial? I'm sorry to make you keep switching it. No worries, you want the aerial? That help? The, uh, the yeah, task yeah. map, the aerial would probably be more helpful. Parcel access. This is the this is the strip right here. Are you sharing it? We're still seeing the other oh, one. Sorry. You see it now? Yep. So this is the this is the fifty foot strip right here. So mm -hmm. it's right, and I'm told that obviously there's a house on it now, but this was going to go straight into there, and then it it would have dumped into Allen, hmm. which was also another way to get to the IBM. Yeah, but if you looked at the previous shot, it was looked like it would just had accessibility to that Duchess Highway. Right. Yeah. Right. It wasn't going to be an overpass or an underpass. It was just going to go right to that road. Yeah, to fine. that road. Duchess Highway. So, as, as for for our purposes, Michael, and I'll I'll lean on you a little bit here. Um, we would need the planning board before they could determine whether or not the lot could be considered a buildable lot. They would need some sort of engineered plans, and they need to be. She would need to be able to prove that it could meet. Section one sixty three nineteen. That's correct. Okay. So the property is going to have to be surveyed as well. Survey, right, Michael? Yeah. Right, it's going to have to be surveyed, and, yeah. and basketball beyond a, a survey for a ten acre parcel is um going to be very expensive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Michael, you seem to be really concerned about my finances. No, I, I just don't want you to to go down a path that you said you were about to close. Understood, but I, with all due respect, I would like you to just help me understand what you want me to do to make this a buildable lot, and I'm happy to comply. And let's not have anybody worry about the finance. But, but I, I think what you're hearing from from the board is that we're concerned you may not be able to make this buildable. So caveat and tour, right? We want to make sure you understand you may not get there. You may not be able to meet the hurdles. Meaning buyer beware if you close prior to and then come back to us and have it not be buildable. We just we would have that blood on our hands. We're here to help you. I, I do. I understand, but it's very important for me to get my mom back over to Dutchess County where she wants to be and grow old. So this is affordable for her, even if I have to put some money into it to develop it. My first hurdle is it's not realistic to come in off Harrigan. Um, but if, you know, if we can get we're, past we're that. Just, we're just calling out to you. We, we've called out to you, certainly the access, right? So the paper road, that's a legal issue you would tackle. Pete has called oh. out to you that you have a potential issue with the septic. Michelle is calling out to you that there's a section of our code that defines all of the things that are required to have a buildable lot. Assuming you can, you can meet those other two hurdles, which are not necessarily easily done, but if you can, you still have to meet all the other requirements within our code for a buildable lot. So we want to make sure you understand what they are. Yes, um, I'm very, I'm, I'm very familiar. 
Um, Louise, um, you know, I really think you, you, know, you should have a discussion with the County Board of Health too in regards to, uh, you know, the parcel, whether it's a lot, whether it's not a lot, how they would, how they, uh, you know, would view it uh, in terms of, um, you know, health department approval for a single family lot there. Uh, you know, I would suggest that either uh, you or you or your engineer um, contact I've them. Actually, and... I've actually already reached out to them almost okay. 10 months ago. All right. And they had no problem coming out and doing perk tests. They said I had to get a building permit first, obviously. I went to, this is how this all started. I put the offer on contingent upon Board of Health approval. Smart thing to do. Went to, I went to Board of Health and they said, I needed to apply for a access permit, a building permit, um, because they weren't gonna climb through Harrigan Road to do the perk test. And um, I'm sorry, I got distracted. They weren't gonna like climb up through the Harrigan Road entrance to get, and to try to get a machine up there to dig the perk holes. That's when I tried to find another access. Did all of my digging around, found the paper roads. So, okay, all right. So you have. So I've already. So that's what led me to you guys. So with access to using the fifty foot right of way in the paper road, would give me the access to do the BOHA. They were pretty confident with ten point nine acres, we were going to get a perk somewhere. I'm only building a two bedroom house. Not going to need an enormous septic either. So, so this is Scott. Can I just comment on something? I asked absolutely. a question. So Pete, Michelle, I'm looking at this in the board. On Harrigan, there's a 50 foot frontage. The, the paper streets, if that's what they are, are something on the order of 50 feet. Our, our code is a minimum 125 foot of frontage on a town road for a lot. This, this can't be considered this can't be considered a flag lot at this stage because that would have had to been incorporated into the original subdivision. So you know it, it, it really it's, is a flag lot, sir. I'm just asking you to move the flag. No, 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 but ma'am, it, it's not a lot. There's no number designation. It's not lot number 50. So it's not an approved lot. And, and it doesn't have frontage. If, I agree with you. If this was an original flag lot as part of the original subdivision, and it was lot number 50 or some other number, then yes, a flag lot would have been permitted. But as I'm looking at this, I, you know, that ship has sailed. This is not a, a lot that's part of that subdivision any longer. Now, it wouldn't matter if it became a highway at some point, but to create a building lot, I think you have a frontage issue as well. Well, is anybody else have any comment on that? Overcome these obstacles? I, I, I mean, I think originally, Scott, to be honest with you, that was my, I, I mean, my initial, and I, when I spoke with Louise initially, I, I explained to her what I, my sort of concerns about this potentially not being a lot. And that was one of the things that I thought about in addition to the fact that it was never uh, intended originally to be a buildable lot. Um, but I don't, you know, I don't, I can't opine on the legality of any of, any of the um, paper roads and the other points of access, but um, you know, certainly you're right. It was never subdivided as a flag lot. Um, Okay, so who makes the determination on whether or not it is or it isn't a flag lot? And who makes the determination on where I go next? So I think, I mean, I think at this point- um, I'm not, 
I, I'm not going to give up. So I'll, I'll do what you want me to do, but you just got to tell me what you want me to do. I need this lot for my mom. So Michelle, is there no way to turn this into a flag lot? I'm not, uh, that, that's the part I don't, I'm not quite clear on. I think we were recommending that Louise go to an engineer and determine if this lot met all of the requirements that are in the code. Correct. In that particular section that you cited. Um, and the question of whether it would be deemed a flag lot is something that the engineer would probably come to the town to ask about, right? Oh, yes. When oh. they when they're going through it, they would look at the size, they would look at what they could, you know, how they could orient it if it would meet all the different zoning requirements. Um, once they took into consideration the environmentally sensitive lands on the site, meaning steep slopes in the, the um, stream um, that goes this, through the site, um, and whether or not they could actually use this access here, um, get a permit to even cross here, that might be an issue as well. I don't know. So Michelle, but, but Michelle I'm, I'm sorry, hold on one second. So Michelle, if the access is through a paper road, does that then say we don't have to worry about whether it's a flag lot or not? Or does that paper road by what um, what the applicant is telling us, sounds like she's trying to make that, I'm going to call it paper road part of her parcel. It's still going to be, it's still going to have to be a flag lot because the only access you have, you don't have the full 125 feet of frontage. So right. no matter what you're still I, I get it access. I get it where where I'm going is though at the point where the paper road becomes considered part of this lot and I'm not saying it can happen I'm just saying legal if legally if that's what she achieves right wouldn't at the point where she achieves that wouldn't it then become the discussion whether or not the addition of that property that horseshoe loop thing makes this a flag lot now to in today's standards based on a change like that to the lot line definition so that was really more like Michelle, like you see what I'm saying? Like, I, I agree in the original subdivision, this wasn't a lot. It wasn't a, that, that even though it looks like it's got frontage and it looks like a flag lot, it doesn't meet flag lot because it wasn't defined as a buildable lot at the time. It was intended to be dedicated for another use. Right. So now we're starting fresh. This piece of land exists. There is a paper road that may or may not connect to it and the applicant has to figure out the legality of that but if it does connect does that reopen the discussion about whether or not this meets the, the flag lot condition does it reopen the discussion about whether or not if it becomes the 50th lot in this subdivision that it can't have well and sewer so I think I'm, I'm just trying to figure out I don't even know where to tell where to well, go with all of those questions Laura you I actually just pointed out something very interesting if I can prove that that paper road is indeed a paper road, just not paved, but a paper road, then that lot has 252 feet of road frontage on a paper road. So then it doesn't have to be I don't disagree with that statement, but I can't tell you whether that paper road is legal or not legal or belongs to you or doesn't. I, I have no idea. That's I'm not sure. something the purview of our board. Understood. That's I just no, but to that argument, the road, our town road, would have to be extended to town road standard to, and establish the 125 feet of required frontage. Yes, that would. And I had spoken to the highway department also, and they had told me that I wouldn't necessarily have to pave it, but I could bring it up to private road specs. But. That's that's the difference between zoning and um, like meeting the zoning for actually creating the lot and then just meeting the, the requirements for putting a driveway in or putting a um, access point. Um, Ray Cronizer thought it would just be best to use it as a driveway because it would only be, I, I don't remember, 12 or 20 feet wide. And rather than having to clear the whole 50 feet, the neighbors would probably prefer I use it as a driveway versus a road. Um, I will comply either way. But just so you understand, Ray, Ray Cronizer is a building inspector and, and he doesn't have any jurisdiction over the planning board, just so you understand. I'm very, under, I understand. I'm just saying it was his suggestion to use it as a driveway so it wouldn't, so we wouldn't have to clear 50 feet. Yeah, he, he has no jurisdiction on this, sorry. 
Okay. Yeah, and I. I know you're Louise, I think I think we've given you a lot of a, a lot of issues that you need to take a look at. Um, there are serious concerns. We're trying to look out for your well-being on this whole thing. Um, I understand, and I appreciate that. I just would like a punch list of things that you would like me to accomplish to get this to be a recognizable, buildable lot. But I think what you're hearing from us is that we don't have a punch list to give you because we we're telling you all of the issues we see it's not up to us to tell you do these 10 things and you're yes it's buildable you have to do the the legwork to find out environmentally sensitive lands the survey whether or not the paper road is part of this parcel or not or what you would do with that to make it not a flag lot or if it is a flag lot make it work we can't tell you all of those things because we don't know what the research is going to going to produce for you any and to Michelle's those... point, now you also layered in from environmentally sensitive lands, not just the slopes, but she sees a stream on the property. So we're trying to give you the benefit of our experience to say this looks very, very tough to us. We've given yeah. you everything we can think of to help you understand how tough it is. It's up to you if you want to continue forward with it, but, but you're doing that with a very, very strong warning from us that we don't know that you can ever get this to be a buildable lot. I understand. And I appreciate that very much. Um, going on Michelle's concern about a stream to the bottom, then that's when I would say, let's look at that middle entrance. And then it would just be a heck of a long driveway. This, this entrance here? Yeah. So that one I think is the most problematic because that's not even 50 feet wide, right? That's only 25 feet wide. Um. Yeah, and it looks fairly close. I know those lines aren't necessarily exactly where they are, but it looks like it's fairly close to one of the houses and the other house's driveway. Yeah. Well, and again, I think it's a question of, you know, again, the survey will tell some, but I think uh, that the applicant really needs to speak to a professional engineer to really give her some guidance as to if this lot is buildable. But a survey is going to determine if she even has accessibility through any of these entrances at this point, except for the Harrigan Road one. Yeah. And I think legally the accessibility through this little horseshoe loop, I, I that's again, not the purview of the planning board and yeah, probably I agree. not of a professional. That's really more of an attorney question. Mm -hmm. and a legal question versus the accessibility of physical accessibility of any of these entrance points. So based on that, um, who is legally, who would you want me to confer with? I mean, because I've already spoken to attorneys who felt that this was a doable thing. Would they get, would, Louise, would they give you a written opinion to that effect? I mean, a hundred percent. They would. 100%. And have they? Um, I haven't asked them to yet, but it would take I mean, not I think, much. I think, I think you need to have some assurances that you can rely on, that you can actually gain title to that and, and use that land. If I were in one of those houses and you started to lay some asphalt down next to my property, I would I would be maybe the first person to try to stop you and say, what's going on here? I, th I think you got some issues, but you need to have something in your hand that says that, yes, this is your property. And then an engineer is gonna rely on that and going with Richard's statement, um, the survey will will include property that, that, you, that you legally own according to an attorney's opinion. And if you look at that middle entrance that Michelle has the picture on right now, the one side of that line literally runs right over the driveway of that home. So you're even talking about that being 25 feet. It's even less at that point. So there are major issues that I see. And again, just my own opinion, but I think uh, that you definitely survey engineer and then this, this horseshoe space has got, there's gotta be a determination made on it. But again, I think a survey tells exactly if you're gonna buy a piece of property, 
that survey tells you what you own. And now these other access points, again, they'd have to be determined. And, and again, the build be, you know, the ability to build on the lot through an engineer's professional opinion and obviously the codes of our township. So you, you have a couple of things here. And again, I don't say that there's a bullet point list that we put together, but it would start in the hands of a professional. And I think professionals, a, a, a land engineer type professional as well as an attorney. Correct. And, and I I'm think I'm still concerned that you would have, to John's point, you'd have a legal battle here with neighbors who are very used to living there and seeing their land the way it currently is, and you'd be disturbing that. And you know, you know what? I appreciate what you're saying, but on the other hand, this property was on a tax auction six times. So at any time, with all due respect, at any time in the last six tax sales, any of those neighbors could have scooped it up for pennies. But it's telling you something. It's not a buildable lot. It's not a buildable <laughs> lot. You. So, and, and so they're, why would they're, using, <laughs> they're using it at no cost to them. Correct. Right. right. Um, no tax cost, no nothing. So you got to kind of, you know, take, take some advice from here. I think I, I appreciate it. I just am really trying hard to get back over to that side. I'm living in Orange County now. My daughter's over there. My mom wants to be over there. So I'm trying to have a little bit of a Hail Mary here and see what we can do to make this work. Well, and and we're telling you it starts in the hands of the of the professional engineer okay. and an attorney and then right. from there forward. And obviously definitely getting a survey in my opinion. Yeah, and, and, and Louise, one question. more thing. Oh, sorry, John. I was going to say one more thing, if I may, is I would sit down with that engineer and I would map out what are all of the issues that you've heard here today and what other issues might he be aware of and try to take them kind of one at a time because you don't want to just blow through this whole thing and find out you get to the end after after engaging a whole bunch of expense and everything and find out that you can't do it. I think if you take this a step at a time and tell them how you want to approach it, it would probably be a smart way to go if you have the time to do it that way. It's going to take some time to get this done. Yes. And Lori made a very important point, in my opinion, right from the beginning. It's it's buyer beware. And like uh, you even said, Louise, yourself, this property had been up for tax sale on several occasions. And I couldn't imagine that if it had some kind of... Um, attraction to somebody that it wouldn't have been bought one of those six times. So the buyer beware thing, I think should just resonate with you. And, uh, you know, I appreciate that. I and do. we're here to help. We're not here to hinder people. We, we like oh, to no, see I, good. Listen, I appreciate it. I, I, you guys all brought up great points. I appreciate your input, but I have a little bit of a dream here and I'm going to keep trying and just so you know, I have actually spent several hours speaking to my engineer. We just haven't pulled the trigger doing anything yet because I didn't have an opportunity to get in front of you and talk to you about what you were thinking and what you feel are obstacles. Now I'll go back to him, but you know, I've already been back there. I've already dug some test holes for perks. I've done a lot over the last several months. So as for the legalities of the, the paper road, I'm very confident based on who I've spoken to, that's not gonna be an issue. This other 49 lot, 50 lot thing, that's now just been brought to my attention. It never was before. I'm gonna jump right on that tomorrow morning. So, um, and you know, the stream I, and the sl steep slopes to make sure that there's not too much environment. We call them ESL or environmentally sensitive lands here that preclude you from finding a building envelope to place a house. So uh, your professional can help you look at that as well. Yes. Well, we did actually, and we thought it would be more towards that wider end. I understand, um, but, but now we're but also calling your attention you. to the stream, which yep. you know, again, you 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 got to make sure that you're careful here. I agree. I totally agree, and I appreciate that. Um, is it correct to say that of all of this 10-acre parcel, 
a minimum of one whole acre has to be considered buildable considering topography and, and environmental standards and all of that, a whole entire acre has to be buildable. Yeah, so it's, it's not quite a full acre. I think it's like three quarters of an acre. I'd have to look at the actual formula, but um, I think in this case, if this is, I mean, it's kind of tricky because if this is gonna be considered a, a um, flag lot, then you actually need one and a half times the minimum acreage. So that's the other thing, um, Louise, you should just make sure you look at the flag lot requirements as well. Um, when you're when you're going through the uh, machinations of, of just the zoning process because um, I, I don't see how it's not how if it were to be considered a lot it would would be how it wouldn't be a flag lot which means that you're always required to have one and a half times the um, actual um, buildable area or actual buildable area not including the pole the flag pole portion of the lot right. um, so it's really going to depend though, Michelle, right, on the legal treatment of this little Correct. horseshoe road, road access. Correct. And that's a legal thing. That's not something we can advise on, but right. you're hearing us say you've got a couple different paths that might be the right path here. You have to figure that out with, with a professional, let a professional look at it with you and let an attorney so, work with you and figure yeah. out what that looks like. So uh, this is Scott again. Uh, I'm just talking out loud. Wouldn't, wouldn't one path be to uh, see about, I mean, I understand it's going to be an uphill battle 40 years later, but to amend, if they want to claim this a flag lot, wouldn't we have to go back and amend the filed map to, to make this lot number 50 get signed off from the health department that they would accept the 50th lot in order for us to consider this a flag lot? Because right now it's just a stand a standalone piece of property. All right, the only way we can consider it a flag lot, we'd have to go back and amend that plan. No? Yeah, I, I, I mean that's how I would, I, I think I would think of it, but I'm not sure if legally I'm thinking of it in the right way. I don't, I don't I'm not sure. Is there is there any uh, municipal hookups here accessible to this site, water sewer? No. Not that I'm no. aware. Okay. Not even remotely. Okay, because that's the only, I mean, that would be the other. Yeah, setbacks from where other people, I mean, there's so many homes on both sides of this lot. Like, how are the setbacks for the wells, you know, comparatively speaking to well and septic with these other homes? And again, yeah, it's not a matter of just finding an area that perks. You got to find the right area that perks yeah. so you don't impact adjoining wells. Exactly. Um, let me, may I throw one more thing at you? If I were to find a way to somehow get in through Harrigan, which really would be tumultuous, but would it then be considered part of this subdivision? Because, I mean, Harrigan Road's got hundreds of houses on it and there's not water and sewer. No, but you're still back to the frontage issue of the 125 feet. Well, right. So well, I you're back to the flag to lot definition, right? Yeah. I'm sorry, what? The only way I see it's a flag lot is if it's part of the subdivision. You can create a flag lot as part of a subdivision. So it's either you got to take the approach. It's going back to amend that file map to include this in that original subdivision, in my opinion. Or okay. if, you, if you look at it as a standalone lot, now you got the issue with the frontage. So either way, it's it's not easy. Okay. In fact, the frontage, but you've got the, the frontage, potential of the road, right? Reasonable. The road off flower. Right. I mean, it coming in off Harrigan is just it's like a ski slope. You, this is a really tough path. Either way, we're you've heard all of our cautions. I'm not sure there's anything else we can caution you on that I can think of. I it's really right. not. So yeah. I will get in touch with the Board of Health Department. I will consult my legal counsel and I will speak to my engineer and hopefully see you all next month. Sure. So I think just on a 40,000 foot level, just so we can sort of summarize where we go from here. Um, I, I think that was a very good summary. And I think before you come back to the board, you'll have to have fully engineered drawings based on a survey. And you'd also submit your title report. 
So then we can, um, you know, look at some of the title issues that we discussed today. And I think then well, you need to the board agenda for productive discussion and you'll speak to the health department. Right, speak well, to the I'm health department. Really yeah. If I don't close, then it won't be a title report, but I understand what you're saying. You're looking for a legal description. But you shouldn't close. You should have a survey before you close too. And a title. Right. Understood. But so you'd have a title commitment, right? right. Okay. Louise, um, I can tell you a title that. report before closing. Have to. You get a marked up title, right? Okay. Louise, we hope we see you back. You faced us with one of the most complex things we've looked at in quite a while. I promise I'm going to be back next All right. month. <laughs> all right. And, okay. and wish you well. Thank Good you luck. very much for all of your time. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Uh, is there any other matter to be brought before the board tonight? No, I just wanted to mention um, that we um, just to remind everybody that we um, we um, adjourn, adjourned the public hearing for Stone Ridge Common, the, the uh, Stone Ridge um, apartment complex for yes. March 9th. I just wanted to make that announcement. The last meeting we did that and I just wanna make sure everybody knows that they're on for March 9th. Okay, excellent. Michelle, that's, a, that's our regular meeting or that's a special meeting? It, that's a regular meeting. It's an early meeting next month. So um, yeah. Okay. Okay, and then we also we bring up, our boxing gloves. <laughs> but we'll also be taking up Hopewell Senior Living as well, correct? Correct. They've they've asked, yeah, they asked to be um, moved to that meeting as well. Okay. Yeah. All right. Anything else from anybody? Nope, and I'll get back to everybody on the uh, site visit. Excellent. And I'll Good. accept a motion to adjourn. So Second. Moved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good night.